Greetings. We are going to be starting a series of apologetics courses. It is going to be a five part series and glad that you could be able to join us for this particular uh, course. Now for this one, we are going to be going into the first part of the course. We're just going to dive straight into it and it is an introduction to Christian apologetics. So let's continue. The question we must ask ourselves is what is Christian apologetics? In 1 Peter 3.15, we read in the middle of the verse, Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you. Notice the highlight there, the word answer. The Greek word used for answer is apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics from. And the meaning of this word is a defense, answer, or reason. So that would mean we are to give a defense of the faith and an answer to those with questions about the Christian faith. <clears throat> so question, why then Christian apologetics? In today's age and culture, skepticism of the faith is still growing, unfortunately. So in order to counter this, we must be fully equipped to handle the claims and questions of atheists, Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Hindus, Buddhists, and several others. This will also help when doing our evangelism today. Now, apologetics is really needed in today's day and age in light of the academic world, the college settings, the rise of liberal theologies in Christianity, etc., is also a command for us Christians to perform apologetics. And we're about to go to that. Now, some Bible verses demonstrating apologetics include mostly just two verses, and they're very important. Now, the first one we go into for these sets of verses is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 through 16 which says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Then you have Jude 3. You know, it says Jude 3, since there's only one chapter, so technically this is just Jude 1 verse 3. But either way, beloved, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now you have two sets of verses in 1 Peter 3, 15, verse six, the verses 15 to 16, and then Jude verse 3. All these are passages that indicate the importance and the command for Christians to engage in apologetics. You could find apologetic verses in other places, but this is certainly where the command is issued for the Christians of the church to go out and engage in what we would call apologetics. Now, the question you're probably asking yourself <clears throat> is, what all do I need to do in order to engage in apologetics? Number one, your Bible. So then you also have to have a basic understanding of sound essential doctrines, uh, some other literary sources that can be useful to help educate you, but are not essential for doing apologetics. They can help, but they aren't essential or needed when you go out and do apologetics. And we will cover more of these when we move on in our five part series. As we can tell, we're only on part one, and we're only just giving it an introduction, so this is going to be a short and basic introduction into the world of apologetics. So what is the proper mindset of Christian apologetics? That should be what we ask. The wrong mindset thinks along these lines. To win debates all the time, every time, no doubt. That's the wrong mind. That's the first part of it. The other one is to mock and humiliate other non-Christians. If you're a Christian, you're safe from this. But if you're a non-Christian, prepare to be mocked and humiliated from my apologetic. The, the other one is to make people look foolish. 
should not have that mindset going in. The fourth one, to seem smarter than others. To seem smarter to others. So, there's the fourth one. Now the fifth and final one is to show how you can win. To show how you can win in a debate. To show how your arguments prove you right. And boom, you get the glory. That should be the wrong mindset. That is the wrong mindset. It should not be how we think. Now the correct mindset of Christian apologetics is to win people over to Christ. It's not about winning debates, but it's about winning people over to Christ. That is how we should think. That is how we should behave. Now the second part is to defend the faith in a way that Scripture says we should. So in other words, we should defend the faith in such a way that it honors God, that it honors Christ, and it honors the message of the gospel. So, that being said, we go on to point out that it, we also have to be humble about our behavior and simply appear mature in the faith. After all, that is what the Bible teaches. Oh yeah, another thing. Honor Christ in our apologetics. So instead of showing how you can win and where the glory goes on to you, honor and put Christ above all things in your apologetics. Now, we're going to go over and examine using what I would call the expository method of commentating on the text or to exegete the text. I would use, I'm going to use that to point out the apologist mindset and the demand for apologetics. So first thing is 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16 and the apologist mindset. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. So that means sanctify, in the particular phrase it uses, is to set apart. So we are to set apart, put apart God to be holy and to honor him in our hearts. So when it says sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, saying essentially, let that be the motivation for your apologetics. Let that be your motivation for the faith, to defend the faith is because of the Lord who made you. All right. Now the other part says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, which means to always be ready to give the defense or answer to the faith to every man that asks you why it, it, why it is so that you believe what you believe. Now, notice, notice that it says, but when you have the asketh, the E-T-H at the end of words, because we're using the King James here, that indicates a continuous ongoing tense. Now, obviously not the same person's gonna keep asking questions over and over and over and over again, but this is to indicate that for some of those that do have multiple questions and everyone else, you will not escape this concept of okay I can finally get a break you'll all if you have someone that asks you a question or brings an objection to the faith your work is never done hence why it says to asketh so every man that asketh you meaning you'll keep receiving this a reason of the hope that is in you so you responding with an answer is something that's going to be expected of you for your lifetime on here and it says with meekness and fear, which is something verse 16 will touch on. Now it says to give this answer with meekness and fear. Now why? Well, if we go on, having a good conscience means to have a good mindset as we are currently trying to discuss and explain in this passage. It says that, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So, Whenever we remain gentle, whenever we are humble and meek in our defense, we will not be put to shame by those who speak evil of us. It is instead them, it is instead the atheist or the Muslim who is in response to us 
that will be put to shame for falsely accusing our good conversation in Christ, for falsely making assumptions, and for falsely trying to behave in a wrong way. So we have those two verses that defend the concept of the mindset, the proper mindset of a Christian. Now, let's go over Jude's command for Christians. When Jude says that he exhorts, or parakaleo, his brothers in Christ, he is saying, he is calling or imploring them to do something. What is it that he calls upon and implores them to do? Well, it says that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered for the saints. And this scriptural passage says we should be defending, which is where contend comes in, we should be defending the faith with a zealous, with a striving fire in our in our stomachs, fire in our hearts, hence the phrase or the word earnestly, when we should be doing that for a faith which was delivered unto the saints. And that refers to the Christians. This message, because of that, is important and should be defended. Now, he commands this since false teachers have crept into the church and the Christian faith must be defended in light of the spreading of heresy by false teachers, and surely there are some people that are here that can relate to that. Alright, so, we can see that there is an importance in the usage of that, of apologetics, as even Jude had points out. So now that you know about apologetics on an introductory level and on a basic level, the next videos in the series will go over the following. Then, so this is going to be the video immediately after this, and it will be on the history of, poly of apologetics, meaning we will get to see what happened, of course, during the first century from the apostolic era with Paul and the rest of the New Testament authors. We will then also go over the early church of afterwards, meaning we'll see in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, and even go up to now. So we go all the way from the 1st century all the way up to now with the history of apologetics. Then the second question, how to do apologetics? How do we do it? So we'll go over more on what is the method that would be perfect for you, and what are just the essentials, since honestly, this idea of classical to evidentialism to presuppositionalism is getting tiring, and people just need to do just do apologetics and just call for apologetics as it is. Now, the question here is then how to answer common objections, which again, that video will go over just that, is to deal with common uh, objections to the faith provided by atheists, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, all these other different religions. And we'll go over them and refute them. Now, the final one will be our conclusion with a recommended resources material, including links to websites and other places that I would recommend. So, now that we got that taken care of, that is all that we're going to be having for this lecture. I hope you tune in for these other four that are coming up. So prepare to take notes if y'all need to. And thank y'all for tuning in for the first introduction to this apologetics course. Like that, take care and I will see you in the next video.